writer and rebel. Her problems in life were very much created by herself. So many of the things she did were regarded as eccentric. They're all peculiar, for goodness sake. The turmoil and triumphs of a woman who lived for her art. Good evening, I'm Gordon Pinsent. Today, Emily Carr is one of Canada's most celebrated artists. But she was a woman out of step with her own time, a rebel in an age of Victorian correctness. An artist dedicated to work, not hearth and home. And she was an eccentric who camped out in the woods with a menagerie of animals, including a pet monkey. Emily Carr's passion spilled onto the canvas in lush landscapes and powerful totems. And it's there in her journals, the voice compelling and exuberant. Tonight, the inner life of the woman behind the artist. Emily Carr is one of Canada's best known and best loved painters and authors. Yet in her time, she was a rebel and an outcast. And her art was not appreciated. Here we have a picture of Emily Carr. Today, all that has changed. And it's sort of, what will we describe this motion here that she uses? Wavy. Oh, she's the most important artist for the gallery. There's no question about it. I mean, this is the great treasure of the Vancouver Art Gallery, is the collection of Emily Carr paintings is here. Uh, she loved animals and even had a pet monkey named Wu who rode around on her shoulder. It is extraordinary that so many generations of people have been excited by Emily Carr. My students today get excited about her. She was fiercely independent, a feminist before the term existed, eccentric and enigmatic, sometimes out of sorts. She was Emily Carr, a woman of all sorts. She's a very human person with all her doubts and with all her characteristics and personality. And she has an audience, of course, for both her books and for her paintings, a woman of two talents. Emily Carr said that Victoria was more English than the English. She was born and lived most of her life here. She is buried here, too, in the family plot in Ross Bay Cemetery. The house in which Emily Carr was born is a heritage site dedicated to her memory. More than a museum, it's a lived-in home for curator Jan Ross and her husband and two young children. Visitors include the merely curious, but for those who care deeply about Emily Carr, her birthplace is an important starting point on a journey of understanding this talented, complex, contradictory woman and artist. Yes, she talks about being born in this house, in the room that's right above us. On a cold, cold December day that she took her time to be born, that the father had to go out in the snow, almost waist deep, to get the midwife for her birth. I was born during the December storm, contrary from the start. The wind blew, trees moaned. The storm in my life has never quite lulled. I've been tossing and wrestling with it, Ever since. I think that she felt that all her life, that struggle, that she did not bend to the conformity of the time. Emily Carr was from a well-to-do family. Her father, Richard Carr, was an Englishman adventurer who made his first fortune in California during the 49er gold rush. There he met his future wife, Emily Saunders, who ventured to California at the age of 14. Emily Carr never learned the family secret that her mother was born illegitimate. 
1863, Richard Carr settled in Victoria with his wife and children. Soon he had a flourishing warehouse business on Wharf Street. He was proud of his home and the life he'd carved out of the Canadian wilderness. But his strict English upbringing would have a lasting effect on Emily. Father was ultra-English, a straight, stern autocrat. No one ever dreamed of crossing his will. Mother loved and obeyed him because it was her loyal pleasure to do so. I obeyed him from both fear and reverence. Lizzie and Alice spent their whole time playing ladies, and I was sure I didn't want to be one of those. I was much more interested in learning how to draw than in learning how to pour tea. Lizzie was four years older than I, was called bigger. Alice was called middle, and I was named small, not only because I was little, but because no one thought I knew much about anything. When Emily was young, she was the apple of her father's eye. The other girls were very girly and um, displayed not a great deal of interest in, in um, spending time walking around the property. They were content to play with their dolls. Um, Emily was really more his companion. I wanted to draw a dog. I sat beside Carlos and stared at him for a long time. Then I took a charred stick from the grate, slid open a large brown paper sack, and drew a dog on the sack. My married sister, who had taken drawing lessons, looked at my dog and said, Not bad. Father spread the drawing on top of his book, put on his spectacles, looked and said, Hmm. Mother said, You are blackened with charred wood. Wash. It was years after her father's death that Emily discovered he'd kept her childhood drawings. He'd been mildly encouraging, but the rest of her family was not. Emily's sisters were dismissive of her art, sometimes openly so. It was a pattern that lasted for years. It was only a short while after our picnic that Mother died. Her death broke Father. We saw then how he loved her, how alone he was without her. None of us could make up to him for her loss. After her mother's death, there was a traumatic incident between Emily and her father, an incident she later described as the brutal telling. Her relationship with Richard Carr was, was very, very close. She was obviously the, the favored daughter. She was certainly the most attractive. And it was Emily who stood at the front door when Richard Carr came home. It was Emily who frequently walked partway to the warehouse with him. So there was a very, very close relationship, of course, until this incident, which she recalled in, in old age, which she referred to as the brutal telling, until this incident occurred when she was probably just reaching puberty. And it probably set the course for her sexual behavior from then on. I couldn't forgive Father. I just couldn't. For spoiling all the loveliness of life with that bestial brutalness of explanation, filling me with horror instead of gently explaining the glorious beauty of reproduction, the holiness and joy of it. We don't know exactly what he said, and this has become a very controversial thing in the Emily Carr literature. You know, could he perhaps have molested her? Could this have been some kind of act of sexual abuse? I don't think so. Whatever the brutal telling was, Carr was so upset and offended that she expressed her anger with her father and refused to talk to him, and he, as a result, became very angry with her, and this developed into a quarrel which was never healed. It was a real struggle for Emily after her mother died to try and find a place within the family. Her mother had really uh, been a buffer between her and the rest of the family and the strict ways. When her father also died and Edith really took control, it became almost intolerable for Emily. The petty disputes really mounted in her eyes. She sought out to escape that by going to art school in San Francisco. And then once she was there, discovered her great love of art. San Francisco was a interesting moment in her life. She didn't particularly work hard. Her work was not exceptional. It certainly did shape her as an artist.
certainly within her own mind. Emily's brother, Dick, who had always been frail, was being treated in a California tuberculosis sanatorium. With no son to carry on the family business, the Carr sisters fell into what was then called reduced circumstances. In the winter of 1893, Emily was summoned home from San Francisco. With the family fortune depleted, she was told she had played at art too long. Although still treated as a child and scorned by her sisters, Emily was now a grown and beautiful woman. And when she came back to Victoria after San Francisco, she then set up shop, as it were. Uh, she began to teach, and she taught in her own home. In the summer of 1898, Emily sailed on the steamship Willapa to visit her sister Lizzie, who was working as a missionary in the isolated village of Euclid on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Perhaps the family hoped that Emily would be inspired by her sister's example. Instead, it began a relationship with native people with whom she made friends and socialized. Charmed by this high-spirited tomboy, they gave her a name, Clee Wick, the Laughing One. Houses and people were alike at Euclid. Wind, rain, forest, and sea had done the same to both. They were soaked through and through with sunshine. I found a man with sympathy and a sincerity I'd longed for, but had rarely achieved among my own people. She was just delighted to find how open they were, how friendly and giving they were to her. It wasn't really that their art seized her at that point in time. It was really more them as a people that attracted to her. Her few months in Euclid was really the uh, first time she talked to them, befriended them, found that she had, in a very kind of childlike way, something in common. It gave her a theme at that time for her art, even though the, the, the tiny miniature watercolor sketches that she executed at Euculet are really not innovative drawings or watercolors in any way. But for her, this was the first step in a certain direction. Summer in Euclid was an overwhelming experience for Emily. The native people had touched her deeply, changing the course of her life and her art forever. When summer ended, she gathered up her sketches and watercolors and boarded a ship heading back to Victoria. On board, she met Mayo Patton, the ship's purser. Well, Mayo Patton was a, was a dear friend, was a close friend. She talks about holding hands with him under the table. He was on her doorstep uh, proposing to her, but uh, it was not to be. Carl was very ambitious as an artist. She wanted to be a professional artist in the full sense of the word. She wanted to compete with the men. In her generation, it was difficult to become a professional woman and expect to be married. And Carl had a very serious moment in her life when someone um, proposed to her and pursued her, and she knew if she refused him, she would probably be on the shelf. At that time, she decided against marriage, and she decided that her career would come first. Emily wasn't in love with Mayo Patton and rejected his marriage proposal. Inclined to flirt in those days, she claimed to love a man who kissed her during a spring tennis party. That was enough to convince Emily that she now belonged to him. But he jilted her. A true, loving relationship would always elude her. I had deliberately set out to kill the love that had overpowered me. I did it in self-defense. It was sapping all the life from me. In 1899, at the age of 28, Emily went to England to study art. She worked hard, but she was often ill and felt out of place. And she missed her beloved West. The stress became too much for her. She suffered a nervous breakdown and spent 18 months in a sanatorium. During the long months she spent there, she kept an illustrated journal she later called Pause, a sketchbook. I think that her great hope of becoming a painter of note within herself all fell apart in England. She put all of her chips into, in, into one hat and it just didn't work out. Five and a half years in London, and I had nothing to show for it. Goodbye to my high hopes, to my youngness. I was defeated. 
On my way home, I stopped off in the Caribou District of British Columbia. Oh, the goodness of my West again. Her spirits lifted when she reached the West she'd missed so much. Now, she was more rebellious than ever. No woman had ever ridden cross saddle before in Victoria. Victoria was shocked. My family sighed. Cross saddle. Too bad. Instead of England gentling me into an English miss with nice ways, I was more me than ever. Pure me. To make ends meet, Emily became a cartoonist when she returned from England, showing imagination and wit in dealing with political, social, and women's issues. Then in 1906, at the age of 35, she moved from Victoria to Vancouver to teach art. It was the right move. Her many students adored being in her classes, and the halls echoed with laughter. And on weekends, she would paint, usually in Stanley Park, where she produced some wonderful early paintings. She put on exhibits and sold some of her work. These were good years, among the happiest of her life. But her interest in painting native culture was about to be renewed. While Emily was in Vancouver teaching, she took a trip to Alaska with, with her sister Ellis. And as the boat came back down the coast, she saw many villages. The poles were falling over, dilapidated, and it was then that she decided that she wanted to, as she said, salvage this art. Carr herself was tremendously aware of the rapidity of development, the way in which white settlement was taking up British Columbia, and she therefore realized that things were changing very rapidly in native villages and in native culture. We passed many Indian villages on our way down the coast. The Indian people and their art touched me deeply. By the time I reached home, my mind was made up. I was going to picture totem poles in their own village setting, as complete a collection of them as I could. She didn't go to the museum to sketch it, although she did later for her own uh, rugs and pottery. But when she went uh, up to the villages, it was really to see it uh, within its own community. You must be absolutely honest and true in the depicting of a totem, for meaning is attached to every line. You must be most particular about detail and proportion. Every pole in my collection has been studied from its own actual reality, in its own original setting, and I have, as you might term it, been personally acquainted with every pole. When Emily Carr decided to document native totems and use this imagery in her paintings, she had no idea that decades later, this would become a contentious issue for some native people. We always talk about Emily Carr's expropriation. Um, you know, when did it start? When did it stop? Uh, you know, it's the same thing with all the mass media that, that expropriates from native culture. Lawrence Paul Yuxwalupton is a native artist whose paintings have been exhibited at the Vancouver Art Gallery alongside those of Emily Carr. In an odd way, there were some things that worked together and, and other things that she just didn't get it. Then I think that that was probably because she was just there as an observer of the things that she was allowed to see. She had a very romantic view. Um, I am a very direct result and being, and that's the difference. Living it and watching it are two different things altogether. My watercolor sketchings of this period were accurate studies of the declining way of life for the Haida, Swimsha, and Kwakuto villages of British Columbia. But the stark reality of Indian art baffled my white man's understanding. She wasn't successful in terms of getting a response from the settler community, but at that time she herself felt that native people were more sympathetic to what she was doing than her own white compatriots. And when she painted in the villages, she made a practice of pinning up the paintings she had done because they were interested. I think Native people were pleased that she was doing that, and she always said, steadfastly said, that it was for the Native people as well that she was doing this and for their children. I had been schooled to see outsides only, not to struggle to pierce. What was this new art Paris talked of? It trained bigger broader seeing. 
Emily had discovered the art of the post-impressionist. From her teaching income and the sale of some paintings, she raised enough money to go to France to learn more about it. And this course was the Mecca of art. It was where Matisse, Picasso, all of these legendary figures were working in. And she attached herself, as frequently happened with, with Anglophone artists, to the Anglophone community, studying with Ferguson, studying with Francis Hodgkins, studying with Fallon Gibb, various people who had a knowledge of Impressionist, post-Impressionist painting and passed it on to her. This artist, Phelan Gibb, um, con told Emily Card that yes, she was quite right to think that Northwest Coast native artifacts were very remarkable and that they were in fact works of art. And Emily Carr had simply found them very fascinating and now it, she was confirmed in the view that they were not only remarkable but also beautiful and aesthetically very interesting. In 1912, when she came back, she thought she should be as accurate as possible, but the force of that French training, the time with Felon Gibb and Francis Hodgkins and things like this, kept coming through. So you saw these gray totem poles that, you know, became purple on the edge or green on the edge or something like this. And that, in a certain way, as a documentarian, was her undoing. I spent many days that summer in the Queen Charlotte Islands struggling to paint their poles. The Indian himself identified completely with this totem, but I could not do that. Nevertheless, I knew that my work had improved. In my older canvases, things were carefully and honestly correct. My newer ones went deeper. In trying to grasp the spirit underlying primitive art, I had totally deserted the traditional school for that of the post-impressionists. By 1913, Emily Carr had completed over 200 paintings and sketches of what she saw as a dying native culture. She mounted an exhibition of the work in Vancouver, hoping that the British Columbia provincial government would purchase the entire collection. But it was not to be. From artist to landlady, when life and times return. the road to excellence, spotlighting the dreams and goals of our Olympic athletes as they set their sights on the Nagano Winter Olympics. Forever committed to excellence, these vignettes are presented by Canadian Dairy Products, official sponsors of the Canadian Olympic team. The road to excellence, presented by the Dairy Farmers of Canada and Royal Bank Financial Group. Rob Boyd was the last member of the famed Crazy Canucks. However, after three career World Cup downhill victories, Boyd is now pursuing new challenges. Let's hope those will be as successful as Boyd's talent on a ski slope. Rob Boyd, Alpine Skiing. Thanks for the memories. Canadian athlete, a source of pride for all Canadians. That wide brown stripe means we're in for a harsh winter. No, mild winter. Wait. It's the black stripe, which means blizzard. While opinions on the weather have differed, folks have always agreed. Lennox is the name to trust for heating and cooling. Let's ask Dave. And you can still count on Lennox today, even if you can't count on the forecast. Got a question, boys? Never mind. Lennox, one last thing to worry about. I've been using Gold Bond for about six years. I've been a gold bond user for about eight months now. I've been a gold bond user for about one year. Uh, the powders just didn't seem to do the trick. To me, gold bond was satisfying. It did the job that it said it would do. You put it on, the itch is gone. Get effective relief with gold bond medicated powder. Triple action gold bond medicates, absorbs, and soothes. I like gold bond. Gold bond works. Gold bond really works. Triple action gold bond. More than a powder, it's medication. Her idea was that the government should buy this collection as a collection, as a historical record. But this was a failure. It was felt that these brilliantly colored, strongly painted pictures favored the color too much to be truly accurate to what they were depicting, so that fell flat. 
There was a depression going on. Many programs were cut. One of them was the purchase of her collection. Another was the building of a gallery. There had been uh, plans to build an art gallery in Victoria. But this was one of the things that went along with the, the 1913 recession. Whether Emily's collection was rejected because of the recession or because her modern style was unacceptable, it caused her to give up on her career aspirations of being a painter. The provincial government's decision not to purchase her collection made her decide that she had to earn a living in some other way. Rather than begin teaching again, she moved back to Victoria. She had received an inheritance and she was able to actually build a four-suite apartment house. World War I had broken out and rental revenues dropped dramatically. Emily was forced to convert her apartments into a boarding house. She later named the House of All Sorts. I've had to become cook and charwoman for the lot of them, and I loathed every minute of it. No, I was not nailed. I was screwed to the house of all sorts. Twist by twist demanded that I forget that I ever wanted to be an artist and buckle down to being a landlady. Emily Carr had, after the, uh, her move back to Victoria, had a period where she didn't paint at all, and that was probably most likely during the war. Then she began to paint again in the early 20s and to exhibit her work. But her production is very low. And what is of interest, I think, for those paintings of the early 20s is that none of them dealt with the Aboriginal theme of her uh, major campaign of 1912 and 13. For 15 years, Emily Carr the artist was Emily Carr the landlady. She took refuge from her tenants and found peace in the apartment attic. On the generous slope of the attic roof, I painted two Indian eagles. They were painted right on the underside of the roof shingles. Their great spread wings covered the entire ceiling of the attic. The heads of the eagles tilted upwards in the bold, unafraid inquiry. I loved to lie close under these strong Indian symbols. They made strong talk for me, as my Indian friend would say. These paintings still exist in the attic of the House of All Sorts, which today is a private residence. No effort has ever been made to preserve or publicly display this work. Emily always loved animals and raised sheepdogs in the backyard of the House of All Sorts to earn extra money. She had a pet monkey named Wu who went everywhere with her. Society in Victoria was not amused. They found her behavior very peculiar. I feel that we're all entitled. I mean, we're all peculiar, for goodness sake. I mean, well, what, what is the standard by which you can judge what people should be? Should we carry something in a suitcase, and if you want to carry it in a wheelbarrow, and, and have, say, two dogs and a guinea pig, and a few things falling out the side? Well, if that's a convenient way for you to do it, well, so many of the things she did were regarded as eccentric, you know, such as taking her buggy filled with some of her menagerie when she went shopping and so on. Just a practical thing, really. She used to wear a hairnet, which had a band sort of around here, and she'd put that on. I think people asked her, well, why did she have that? Because the wind blows the hair in my eyes. So that was that. You know, I think she used her eccentricity as a kind of fort behind which she could do her thing, you know, a kind of protection, like like a, like a creature building a, a shell, a carapace, within which they could find their, their space to create what she had to create. Just an incredibly strong woman. Strong or not, Emily might have remained an unknown struggling artist if it had not been for the exhibition on West Coast art, Native and Modern, organized in 1927 by the director of the National Gallery, Eric Brown, and folklorist Marius Barbeau. Their decision to feature Emily's paintings would end years of isolation and become the single most important event in her career as an artist. So it really wasn't until Brown got the idea of uh, putting on this exhibition that Carr was invited, and invited at the very late stage. But of course, when Eric Brown saw Emily Carr's painting, he was totally bowled over. And of course, she 
she ended up dominating the exhibition. The exhibition wasn't as important as really meeting the group of seven, meeting Lauren Harris. Harris and Carr had this great spiritual affinity. They struck a chord from the beginning. Oh, God, what have I seen? Where have I been? Something has spoken to the very soul of me. All these men, this group of seven, what have they created? Lovely faces filled with wonderful serenity. What language do they speak, these silent, awe-filled faces? Wait and listen. You shall hear by and by. Her meeting with the group of seven was tremendously important for her because she discovered she had so much in common with them. She discovered an art community where artists shared goals and could give one another mutual support and encouragement and stimulus. So they accepted her into that art community. And she found personally a very important mentor in Lauren Harris. Carr and the group shared a deep commitment, I think, to creating a modern Canadian art. They also felt that the landscape was an essential element of the spirit of Canada. Seeing Harris's work, she saw, yes, that's what I want for my own work. Not that she wanted to paint Lake Superior, not that she wanted to paint exactly the same motif, but it was a feeling, it was a sense, it was a, a union with the landscape. With the 1927 exhibition, Emily Carr had become known in Canada's art community. Composer Murray Adaskin sought her out. I first met Emily Carr in 1935 here in Victoria. We were visiting friends and we were coming to the end of our very pleasant and happy visit here. And I said to my friends, I would like to greet Emily Carr and pay my respect to her. So they took me there to her house. There was a lady on her knees pulling out dandelions. And I went over to her and I said, does Emily Carr live here? And she said, yes, I'm Emily Carr. <laughs> well, I was quite shaken by that. Here is a stoutish elderly lady with a bed then around her head, and, uh, but a very charming voice. And my wife was with me at the time. Uh, she took us in to her house. In the big living room at that time, her chairs were up on the ceiling, and she let them down with a pulley, and, and she dusted them off with her apron, and, and she said, you know, I hate a cluttered room. <laughs> Success as a writer, when Life and Times returns. <laughs> Meet Marion Payne. Thinks security doesn't just come up and tap you on the shoulder. Thinks it's something you earn. She'll let very few people tinker with her bike. Won't let anybody tinker with her financial future. Makes campus savings bonds a big part of her plan. When you're on solid ground, you can go wherever you want. Ride on, Marion. You wanted kids, but you loved to drive. Last time we checked, that wasn't a crime. That's why the Pontiac Transport has four-wheel ABS available all-weather traction control and a 180 horsepower V6. Which means when you take them for a drive in the country, you take them for a drive in the country. Finally, a minivan built for drivers. The Pontiac Transport. Got a dirty, filmy shower door? You've got a choice. You can try to scrub it, or you can CLR it. And that rust-stained bathtub? You can try steel wool, or you can CLR it. If you want fast and easy cleaning, try CLR. It's guaranteed to instantly remove the toughest stains caused by calcium, lime, and rust. CLR glass decanters, quick and clean. CLR your pots and pans. CLR those water spot stains and your toilet too. CLR the stucco wall. Run a little through an empty washer cycle and get rid of rust stains in your machine. CLR works all over the house. It's guaranteed or your money back. So for tough stains in kitchens, bathrooms, basements and more, 
The choice is CLR. Available at participating Canadian Tire, Home Hardware, Kmart, Safeway, Zellers, Pro Hardware, Dewitt Centers, True Value Hardware, Beaver Lumber, Co-op Store. If you're looking for the truth, get the latest issue of TV Guide. In this week's X-Files edition, you'll uncover classified information about the exciting new season of TV's most intriguing show. You'll get an in-depth review of last season's twists and turns, plus a revealing glossary of recurring characters. The entertainment is out there. It's all in this week's X-Files edition of TV Guide. On sale now. <laughs> supermarket go this far for you from shooting the perfect hawaiian sunrise to finding a bouncing surfer guy what kind of fees would, would we be talking about here regina's douglas walker's on the road with a multi-million dollar ad campaign photographer king tuesday night on venture the suburban dream goes toxic i can't believe someone would build a house on garbage yeah, thinks that here right? and city officials turn a blind eye with any home there's settlement it's not normal settlement. Kitchener homes built on a former dump. Would you like your children exposed to that? Tuesday at 9 on the 5th Estate. Inspired by Lauren Harris and the group of seven, Emily Carr began her second phase of native paintings. At the age of 57, she undertook a major sketching trip to northern villages. Time was running out both for myself and for the Indians. Oh, how I've wasted the years. Beloved West, don't crush me, but keep me high and strong for the struggle. It was not that Emily Carr wanted to paint like the Group of Seven at all. It was that she thought that she could do what they had done for the Northern Ontario bush in the West Coast. In a very, very short period of time, in, 19, in the summer of 1928, she goes from things that look like 1912 to things that look semi-cubist. And I mean, that sort of shift that takes place um, is something that, you know, just shows how rapidly she was evolving at the time and how excited she was about, you know, discovering this, this material again. She's still reworking, to some extent, the earlier project, which was to document the Aboriginal art in its original setting. But ultimately, this, I think, became a dead end for her. And as Harris said, what you're doing is trying to make art out of art. By depicting the totem poles and the carvings, you are, in fact, painting art. What you really should go to is nature. She went back to the forest, first just making trips in, staying wherever she could, and then buying this crazy little box, this sort of caravan that she called the elephant, and she would have this hauled out to the woods. Here was the caravan up on a hill. All the animals were, were out doing whatever they wanted to do, and Emily Carr and her student and my wife and I sat on a grass slope and we just talked for hours, and that was absolutely wonderful. And then she took us into the caravan to show us where her various animals slept. Each one had its own box above. She said, this is Woo's room, and this is the bird, and this is the cat, and this is the dog, and so on. And they all, they all knew their own place. I've never, I don't remember ever seeing uh, a mixture of animals that treated each, treated each other in a way that very polite people treat each other. When she was in the forest, certainly in the 1930s, she reached that high that perhaps few of us will ever reach. And I think you see this in the work. They are magnificent, lyrical, free oil on papers. They're wonderful, magical works which lift and swirl and move everyone who views them.
yesterday, the pain that has come and gone intermittently for many years, came and stayed. Dr. McPherson diagnosed it heart. I have been a roustabout from a babe going pell-mell after what I want. How can I learn to walk no more in the glorious woods with my sketch back on my back? She asked me if I would help with her panels. She did most of her paintings on wood panels, most of them, the big ones. And she said if I would help her get them sorted in order. And uh, I said I'd be delighted to do that. After we've been doing it for some time, she said, what one would you like? You pick anyone you like to have for yourself. And I said that I know exactly which one I would like. And she said, why did you pick that one? And I said, because I think it's the happiest one of all of your paintings that I've seen. It's very happy. And she said, turn the painting over. You'll have to look very carefully, but I think it'll still be there. And I did. And there was tiny little writing, and it was scratched. Happiness. She was so pleased that my reason for choosing it was because I found it a happy painting. Emily could be outspoken and rude. Sometimes her criticism of other artists bordered on petty jealousy. In the 1930s, she met a young Jack Shadbolt, later a prominent British Columbia artist. She wasn't friendly, saying more work and less talk will make him a better artist. I think she thought Jack was a young punk, you know, and too wordy. One day he and his friend John McDonald had gone to visit her and had a pile of these oil on paper, oil on paper paintings in her studio. And she said um, they could each take one if they want. They could have their pick. I think it was for $10 a piece. And Jack, <laughs> who had his eye on a book, can you believe it, on Raphael that cost $10, and he opted to get the book. The paintings which Emily Carr offered that day for $10 were later valued at more than $100,000. As she became less able to, you know, go out in her caravan and, and paint and walk around like that, she did, she always wrote, but then she became very interested in writing. And I felt that her writing, uh, it was so much what she was. I mean, you couldn't read a sentence and not know that it was Emily who wrote it. I mean, she was very, very individual in her expression of things. Writing was tantamount to painting in many ways. And in fact, she, she often wrote of the forest before she painted it. So this was, these, were, these were two forms of art that existed side by side. Eventually, not until the 1940s, late 1930s, did Ira Dilworth from the, the CBC have a look at her work and, and, and really encourage her. Some of Emily's Clee Wick stories about her early visits to native villages were read over the national radio broadcasting system of the CBC. Tonight, we present Clee Wick, the writings of Emily Carr. I was sketching... The last two Mondays, I have been on the air and listened to my own thoughts coming back to me like echoes out of space. Dr. Frederick reads them beautifully. I went there in one of its empty times, in a drizzling dusk. When the Indian agent dumped me on the beach in front of the village, he said, There is not a soul here. I will come back for you. Many, many Canadians were introduced to Emily Carr through those readings. They had no idea who she was. They had no idea that she was a painter. But Cleewick, the writing and the, the turn of phrase, the subject matter at that point in time, which was in the, the time of the Second World War, captured the imagination and the hearts of many Canadians. And of course, what's interesting, I think, is that Emily Carr's uh, first uh, national reputation really came as a writer, not as a painter, when she was awarded the Governor General's Medal for her uh, first book, Clee Wick. Um, and before, although she was certainly known as a painter, uh, the awa this award was much uh, greater uh, recognition than anything that had happened earlier. Ira Dilworth was uh, a very talented uh, man, very well versed in literature, 
and saw Emily's story very much in the raw stage. And if you look at the manuscript in the National Archives of Canada, you will see that Guy did a lot of work on them. There's a lot of red ink dripping from the stories. And Carr accepted all of his changes. And it's interesting to note that critics who have criticized her for appropriating Native Indian culture should really look at those manuscripts very closely because many of the things that she's now been criticized for saying were in fact written by Ira Dilworth. Carr records in her story in Pee Wick that the missionary asked her to use her influence with the Russes to make sure they sent their children away and Emily Carr's reply was, why should Native people send their children away to become ashamed of their people's tradition? She thought that was a very bad idea and she did not like the residential schools. And people haven't known that about Emily Carr because that passage, many passages in which she specifically criticizes missionary attitudes towards the native people have been censored from Peewick. They've been cut out by the publishers between the first edition and the school's edition so that the current editions of Peewick that you buy in the shops don't have those passages in them. This is, I think, one of the reasons that people don't realize how committed Emily Carr was to justice for the native people and to the native people's viewpoint and how difficult life was being made for them. In her books, Emily Carr described her life as a struggle, yet she gave two different versions for the cause of her hardships. I changed my mind about Emily Carr's struggle story, primarily because after reading her autobiography, a very public work called Growing Pains, in which she charts the rebuffs of her life, the Easterners didn't like her, the People in Victoria didn't like her or her paintings. Even Vancouverites didn't like her. She then went on simultaneously in her journals to write about how unhappy she was, how her problems in life were very much created by herself, were a product of her own temperamental failings. Years of illness and several heart attacks had taken their toll. This is the last picture taken of Emily Carr during an outing at her beloved Beacon Hill Park in Victoria a short while before she died on March 2nd, 1945. There was some truth to the myth of the unrecognized artist. Only 50 people attended her funeral. Fighting over the spoils when life and times return. And now we join Larry on vacation for the Carrier Indoor Weather Report. Oh, Lisa, the weather is just beautiful here. It's a balmy 22 degrees, perfectly clear, and just a hint of humidity. <laughs> I love it here. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And tell our viewers, where did you find such great weather? Hmm. I went to the only place I know of where I can truly predict perfect weather. Which is? I'm at home. Carrier custom-made indoor weather. Mandalay Entertainment presents Brad Pitt in the story of a man who pushed himself beyond all borders. Get down! Tested himself beyond all limits and found himself at the top of the world. Seven years in Tibet. Opens Wednesday in select cities, opens Friday everywhere. The circumference of the world is almost 40,000 kilometers. Think about it. Our new Malibu can go around the world four times before two months. Oh, a cowboy! Look at that! Wow! Oh. Hey, there's that cowboy! 160,000 kilometers before its first scheduled tune up. The new Malibu from Chevrolet. Get the latest issue of TV Guide. In this week's X-Files edition, you'll uncover classified information about the exciting new season of TV's most intriguing show. You'll get an in-depth review of last season's twists and turns, plus a revealing glossary of recurring characters. The entertainment is out there. It's all in this week's X-Files edition of TV Guide. On sale now. To be fair, 
the best way to judge something new is to simply compare it to what has come before. Head to head. Apples to apples. Except in this case it wouldn't be fair. And not so simple. Because this time, what's new is not an apple. Introducing the daring new Audi A6. Imagine how the apples must feel. His future was decided. He would follow in his father's footsteps as his father had before him. His life was planned to the last detail. Except nobody planned on love. I, Edward VIII, do hereby renounce the throne for myself and for my descendants. History Television, a compelling new network about the people and events that shaped our world. Coming October 17th, History Television. It's about time. Really, really like your music. One aspiring artist. I'll get my way. Two rival labels. This is the richest deal we have ever offered a group. I've got to see a band about a contract. Not a Celia. Your pockets are dry deep enough. Platinum Rock, CBC, October 12th. Browsing the web for a wife. I found the dear through the internet. But you can get burned. I got angry mom of one girl. Russian brides in cyberspace. She told me why you wasn't my daughter. Tuesday night at 8 on Marketplace. Emily's difficulties in life did not end with her death. She had left the royalties from the published manuscripts to Dilworth and Inglis. But it was not quite clear who would receive the royalties for the posthumous publications. I think a close reading of the will would suggest that Alice Carr, the last surviving sister of the Carr family, should have received these royalties. Had Alice, as perhaps should have, had she received those royalties, then they would have gone to the Queen Alexandria Solarium for crippled children in Victoria, to whom Alice left everything. After Emily Carr's death, Lauren Harris of the Group of Seven, one of the executors of her will, divided the several hundred paintings in her studios into three categories. The Emily Carr Trust Collection, to be donated to the people of Canada. Paintings to be sold to fund an art scholarship. And those that were simply to be discarded and destroyed. There's a lot of work to be done to resolve the mystery of the collection at her death. What happened to it? Why did Lauren Harris select what he selected? Why did he destroy what he destroyed? So if Harris had had his way, we wouldn't know any of those pictures. Subject matter of France, of England, of, you know, still lives she painted in San Francisco aren't of any interest. Now, the cynic would say he's interested in pictures that show the influence of Lauren Harris, but I'm not going to be that nasty to him. Um, I think he felt that, you know, her true voice was about Canada. What's of interest is when she's conveying the country. There's a search in her art, a constant exploration, a constant growth. Seasons greetings from all of us at CBC.